Hello, Woodland Hills. Good morning to you. You look marvelous this morning. You look marvelous. I'm Greg Boyd, teaching pastor here. Uh, it's just a good day uh, to be together and worshiping God and never hear from his word. Uh, I, let me say this about Nick and Madeline. They're, they're friends of mine, dear friends. I've known them for quite a while. I've been down to Haiti a number of times. And, and the work they do is so beautiful. It's it's the kind of thing that's working in Haiti uh, you, you, at a grassroots level, and you empower people. You don't come in as the savior, and it's got all the answers that are going to fix stuff. You take your resources and partner with people and let them d direct you and, and, and guide you and all that. And they've just renovated, I mean, really significant improvements on several uh, of these towns, really improving the quality of life there. So really pray about, about partnering with them. Um, I, I, my first big memory of Nick, we, we were... It was one of my first times down in Haiti, and, and he had given a, a, a real thorough talk about, uh, you know, you have to take some precautions because there's some bugs down there that we don't have up here, so we don't, we don't have an immunity system to it, so, you know, watch what you eat, and blah, 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 blah. We go down there, and all of us who were visiting Haiti were fine. We just, well, Nick got sicker than a dog. He, he, was, he got food poisoning of some sort, and this poor guy, man, yeah, he was close to death. He, he was projecting. It was, it was, it was, it was nasty. But uh, he didn't die, so the work goes on. So I really encourage you to think, uh, <laughs> he's not dead yet. So I encourage you to stop by there and, and, and partner with him. So we're starting a new series here this morning called Loose Ends, because there's these passages in the Bible, I'm sure that you've come across several of them, where it's, you just go, what? And, and they just sort of dangle those loose ends. And so we just kind of usually ignore them or whatever. But we, what we want to do in this series, and it's going to go throughout the whole series, is take some of these passages that are just weird. I mean, we, we've done twisted scripture before where people, like, we think have misinterpret passages. But these are passages that are just weird. Like, what is going on with that? And, and uh, we want to try to unpack them, de-weirdize them, uh, and, and, and maybe show how there's a life lesson we can learn out of it, hopefully, at least some of these. So, since we're going to be taking communion here this morning, we thought we should start with a weird passage about communion. It's one that I'm sure some of you have come across before, and it may have been troubled by it. And some of you, I bet, come from traditions where you've been tormented by this one. Uh, I've had a little of that myself. So here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 11. Have you seen this verse before? Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Talking about coming together and having communion. Examine yourselves. And only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. And for this reason, because of this judgment, many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. What is up with that? passage. <laughs> okay, so uh, it seems like Paul is saying, does it not seem like Paul is saying, when you come together to have the Lord's, Lord's Supper, the communion, examine yourselves very carefully to make sure that you're worthy, because if you, if you take this communion in an unworthy way, if you're not worthy of it, you're bringing judgment upon yourself, and you could get sick, and you could die because of that judgment. And given that we're going to take communion here in about 30 minutes, this is kind of an important topic, don't you think? Because <laughs> basically, if this reading of the passage is right, it's, it's basically saying, are you willing to bet your life on the fact that you are worthy to take this communion? Because that's what you're doing. If you're not worthy, you guessed poorly. Uh, and, and you'll be sick. Uh, maybe be like Nick was down in Haiti and have food poisoning of some sort, maybe diarrhea. Who knows what you're going to get, but you could even die. This is, this, is, uh, this is serious stuff. Is this what we're supposed to be doing here? Um, avoiding judgments. I would think that the person who would be the most unworthy to take communion would be the one who is perfectly confident that they are worthy and therefore is willing to bet their life. Wouldn't they be guilty of pride? Isn't that taking the, the, the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way? So even if you think you're worthy, you're not. So why are we doing this? <laughs> it's like, Man, the stakes are kind of high on this. And it'd be nice if Paul would give us a little bit of a criteria about what, what, what worthy means. Like, give us, 
How are we supposed to know that we're worthy? Is there a checklist you can give us? You know, like 94 items that will disqualify us. Because um, otherwise, how would you know? It, it, it's like one of those questions, like, I think, but maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm not. But what you do know is the consequences can be really, really severe if you happen to be wrong. And um, whatever the criteria is, it gives this impression. And here's like, something's got to be off here because this almost gives the impression. In fact, this reading of, of this passage certainly gives the impression that the church is kind of a holy club. We're the worthy ones. And we come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you're worthy, are you worthy? And so if you're worthy, you consider yourself worthy, you examine yourself, and yep, I'm good to go. You come up, and, and we, the worthy ones, take communion. And, but we'll find out tomorrow who was not worthy because they'll be sick or maybe even dead. <laughs> hey, my Bible says, all right, I'm just preaching my Bible. And so, yeah, it, 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 it leads to this question, um, like, if that was the right reading of the Bible, I'll tell you, I, I will be the first to say I am never taking the communion again, if that's true. Because if you ask me if I'm worthy, I don't have to even do any, any, any introspection about that. No, I'm not. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's done with. But then that leads to this question of, of why aren't I dead yet? How come I'm not dead yet? Because I'm sure I've taken communion unworthily before. In fact, I don't think I'm ever worthy. And I've been taking communion since my first communion was in first, I was like six, seven years old. And so how come I'm, I, I don't recall one time getting sick from having a bad communion experience. Have you? Like, oh, man, I must not have been worthy. Oh, this is landing wrong. No, I've never had anything like that. And, 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 and if this is like the, uh, a true thing that, that, you know, you get judged if you don't keep the communion worthily and some get sick and some die, wouldn't we be like having a lot of people sick and dying all the time, given all the communion taking that's going on? And I'm sure a lot of it is not worthy. Done by unworthy people. I've been in services where, really back in my, I don't know what I got a name for you, but, but people would come in, in this church, the communion was all important, but they would come in, they skipped skip the sermon, come in, get communion, and then they'd leave. So it would be a four-minute experience. It's like a fast food chain communion. You'd like, just dish them out. <laughs> the idea was you want to get in and out as fast as possible. And so they would time this. And, and I would think that'd be unworthy, but how come they're still alive? And no one died. In fact, if this was a standard thing, I would think we would have a whole history of people getting sick and dying from communion because there's people who are always taking in unworthy ways. It'd be like normal for us. Like, it'd probably be on the news. They have uh, a daily report on sacramental fatalities uh, where, yeah, this week uh, we've had, you know, 18,474 people who got ill from taking communion unworthily and, and uh, 7,314 unfortunately died, uh, 74 of them from Woodland Hills. They had a bad week that week. A lot of unworthy people that week. But um, it's down from the all-time high three weeks ago where they had no. So it'd be like a normal thing. So the fact that that doesn't happen tells me that maybe there's something else going on. There's something odd here. Uh, it, it's almost like, you know, they, like, like the communion is, is a poison, and, and, and the, only, the only way to have immunity to it is if you're worthy. And so we're drinking it. It's, it's, like, it's, it's just like with the snake handlers in Appalachia. Have you seen those guys? They play with these snakes, poisonous snakes. And, and you'll know that you're worthy if you don't die. <laughs> but if you get bit and die, you know, well, then... Sucks to be you. You lack faith or something. You know, it's like, oh, you didn't have enough faith? Too bad. Well, if that's the deal, I'm not going to play with snakes, and I'm not going to take communion because the stakes are too high. But there's something going on here. What, what is the deal? Um, so you've got to dig down when something's weird. Uh, it, 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 admit that it's weird. Dig down and zoom out. Look in the broader context. In this case, zooming out, I think, will do the trick to answer the question of what is Paul talking about in this weird passage. So to understand this passage, this thought really begins back at verse 17. Ten verses before the one we read in verse 27. So here, here's what we read. Uh, Paul says, now in the following instructions, I do not commend you. I'm not going to be praising you on this one. He's kind of ticked off. Because when you come together, it's not for the better, but it's for the worse. Um, Paul shared this ancient view, which I think has a lot of truth to it. It goes back to Aristotle, that groups amplify what is found in the individuals who, who comprise that group. And when you join a group, any kind of a crowd, um, it can be the case that it amplifies the virtues of the people in the crowd, and, and so it makes everyone better. The, the crowd raises everybody a little bit. 
But it can be the case that, the, that a crowd could amplify the vices of the, the individuals, in which case, uh, as part of this crowd, everyone's worse than they otherwise would be. And the goal of the church is, the church ought to be, obviously, the kind of place that makes you better than you otherwise would be. But Paul says, when you come together, it's for the worst. You're actually hurting each other. For to begin with, he's got a lot of on his mind here, for starters, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. If you're, in the next two verses, it becomes clear that Paul, to the full extent, believes it. Uh, he, there's no hesitation here. But that's like a sarcastic comment. Uh, it's, a, it's just like us when we say, I can't believe it. You do believe it, but it's like you're expressing your exasperation. I, can't, I can hardly believe what I'm hearing. So he can hardly believe what he's hearing. There are some divisions. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. And he, there he's just saying trials come and divisions are part of these trials, and everyone shows their true color in, in a time of trial. But then he says this, and this is the important verses. When you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. You think that's what you're doing. You call it the Lord's Supper, but Paul's going to say it's not the Lord's Supper. For when, you, when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry while another person gets drunk. What? <laughs> He's like, what is up with you guys? This is communion we're talking about here, right? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? If that's what you want to do, do it in private. Or do you show contempt, contempt for the church of God, and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you on this? No, in this matter, I will not commend you. Okay, I love the church at Corinth, and especially for all you pastors out there, parishioner pastors. Uh, if, if you're feeling like your church is immature, you're bemoaning the fact that it's not growing up, and you're feeling discouraged, I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians, because it will encourage you. Your church will expect spectacular by comparison to the Corinthian church. They, it was a zoo. It was a, it was a carnival. It, it's amazing that Paul had so much patience with these folks. Uh, he calls them saints, and he's always giving them the benefit of the doubt. But they had some, they had some cray cray stuff going on. Like, like they get together, and they turn all the gifts of the Spirit into a contest. You know, they all want to speak in tongues at the same time, or someone's got a word, or someone's got a, uh, a story, or a scripture, or a song, and, and they're competing with each other. And so Paul has got to like, okay, you guys, here's the deal. If you're all speaking in tongues at the same time, and someone comes in from the outside, they're going to think you're crazy, because you are crazy. So knock it off. And then he says, okay, let's try this. Real deep Christian theology here. How about we go one at a time? Okay, can we take turns, let the other person finish, and then you can start. And, and, and if it's speaking in tongues, okay, you guys have been going a little overboard, so let's limit that to three or four at the, at the most, all right? And there's got to be an interpreter, otherwise shut up, okay? And, and, and let's do it decently and in order, because God likes order. I mean, this is where this church is at, turning it into a religious contest. And then they've got this guy who is, is sleeping with his stepmother, having sex with his stepmother, and, and everyone knows about it, and no one's doing anything about it. In fact, there's, some scholars argue that you can kind of you can read it in between the lines in these passages where the Corinthians are actually proud of this because they think it's a badge of honor on how much grace they give. We're so gracious, we don't care who you have sex with. And Paul is pulling out his hair if he had any hair left. He was, he was he's beside himself. These people, just are, your, your theology is all jacked up. And then there's, in chapter 6, that happens in chapter 5, in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul's got to talk to the guys. It's, it's a come to Jesus meeting because these guys just aren't yet quite getting it that when you're a follower of Jesus, you shouldn't be going to prostitutes. Uh, Corinth was known for all of its prostitutes, right? It was a prostitution city. And so Paul has to say, okay, you guys, when you join yourself with the Lord, that means you're not supposed to join yourself with the prostitute, okay? Can we, we've been over this before, okay? Do you got that? Don't sleep with prostitutes. Not the brightest church in the world. And then, then they're taking each other to court. They're suing one another. And that's one of the things Paul's most outraged with. You guys are supposed to be the, the, the you're going to be rulers. You know, you're supposed to be, you're going to be judging the angels. You're supposed to be the light of the world. You're supposed to be light and darkness. And here, you're taking each other to secular courts to sh settle disputes over stupid stuff. So there's just a lot of bizarro, crazy, immature stuff at Corinth. And now we find out that this body of people, when they come together to have the Lord's Supper, to celebrate the goodness of God and the generosity of God and take the sign of the covenant to remember the profundity of, of Jesus and all he did for us. In those moments, some folks are 
hoarding all the food and drinking all the wine to the point where they're getting drunk. Well, these folks over here are hungry and don't have anything to drink. And this is supposed to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. He's like, what, 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 where, where is your head? Where are you, what are you thinking here? So what would happen? Back in the early church, they, they had communion as part of a whole supper. When they come together, they have a meal. And it would be kind of like a potluck. Everyone brings their stuff. Trouble is, some people were very wealthy and had a lot of good food and a lot of good wine, and some people had nothing. But since you're celebrating the Lord, you know, and, and, and he's all about his generosity towards us and how we're supposed to be Christ-like, and uh, you'd think that this would be a time for sharing. Generosity, wouldn't you? If ever you're going to share, you might want to do it when you're celebrating the sign of the covenant. But it didn't happen. The rich folk all got together with their fellow rich folks, and they eat all the good food and drink all the great wine. So they're gluttons and drunkards. During communion. Uh, and the other folks are going hungry and have nothing to eat. and can't even celebrate the Lord's Supper because they don't have any bread or any wine. And Paul is saying, basically, um, you're kind of missing the point here. You, 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 hello? You, 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 this isn't lining up. The way you're celebrating the Lord's Supper doesn't look anything like Jesus on the cross. So then he reads them the words, the traditional words that were passed down to him to remind him what communion is all about. So here's what he says. He says, I received from the Lord what I also handed over to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way he took the cup also after supper, so they had this supper, and then they would share these words. Uh, after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The point, Paul is saying, is to proclaim the Lord's death. You're, 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 with our life, with our, this ordinance, with our church, we are be, to be proclaiming the significance of Jesus dying for us. The goodness of God is, that's revealed in him and, and, and the love that is behind that. And the new covenant that we're a part of. And, 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 and we remember what he's done for us and then we recommit to living that kind of way. That's the purpose of the Lord's Supper. It's a, it's a sign of the covenant. But the way you guys are celebrating the Lord's covenant has nothing to do with that. It's the opposite of that. You're actually mocking it. You're showing contempt for it by the, the, the way you're, you're, you're treating this. Uh, it's an absolute dishonor. And, and uh, uh, so you, you call it the Lord's Supper, but it's not really the Lord's Supper at all. And then he, he gives the three verses that we started off with. Let's read them again. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Okay, now that we have this context, we can see more clearly what Paul's talking about. Notice here, he's talking about what's unworthy. Something being unworthy. And something's unworthy if it doesn't match the value of something. If I, if I treat you uh, in a mean way, I'm treating you in a way that's not worthy of you because you have unsurpassable worth. And my job is to reflect that unsurpassable worth by how I interact with you. So it'd be unworthy of me to call you a jerk or something. Um, so what I want us to notice here is this. That the, the, the thing that, the worth that Paul's considering here is not the individual believer. He's considering the Lord's Supper. And he's, he's not saying to folks, you inter, introspect to see if you are worthy of the Lord's uh, Supper. What he's doing is he's talking to the whole community of, 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 at Corinth, and he's saying, you as a body have to look at this, and are you taking the... the, the are you celebrating the Lord's Supper in a way that is worthy of the Lord's Supper? Does it reflect the meaning of the Lord's Supper? Does it reflect the value of the Lord's Supper? And his whole point is that they're not. What's unworthy here is the, that in, a, in, a, in a, a, a sacrament or an ordinance that's all about celebrating the generosity of God and then the generosity of his people in response to the generosity of God, as a sign of the covenant, you're doing the opposite of that. You're mocking it. You're throwing contempt on that. And so what I want us to see is that it's not about how we're supposed to look in, be introverted and introspective and asking the question, am I worthy? No, no, no. It's not, that's not the issue at all. The issue is are, are we celebrating the Lord's Supper in a way that is worthy of the Lord's Supper? Does it deserve to be called the Lord's Supper? That's what's that issue here. And it's very, very important. 
Because I would think the last thing we want people to be doing as we're celebrating the Lord's Supper is looking inside themselves, asking the question, am I worthy of this? In fact, I think the obvious answer to that, if you have any spiritual maturity at all, is you know that you're not. That's why we need a Savior. Uh, this isn't the time to be doing introspection, am I worthy? Because this, this celebration is not about your worthiness or my worthiness. It's about his worthiness. And that he, in giving his all for us, he's worthy of all of our praise and worthy of all of our honor and worthy of all of our life. Because he died for us when we weren't worthy. In fact, he died for us because we weren't worthy. If we were worthy, we wouldn't, he wouldn't have had to die for us. And so it's not about your worthiness. It's not about your righteousness. How righteous are you? Are you righteous enough? No, of course you're not. Uh, it, it, this is about turning our eyes off of ourselves and putting on him, the one who is righteous and who by dying for us made us righteous by his grace. But it's his righteousness, not our own. And, and this isn't the time to be asking the question, oh, am I faithful enough? You know, am I, am, do I deserve to take this because I've been faithful? It's not about your faithfulness. It's about his faithfulness in spite of your unfaithfulness. <laughs> That's why it's called grace. Folks, communion is not the time to, to be falling into this labyrinth of, of questions that are more worthy and assessing yourself and, and all. No, this is the time to take your eyes off yourself. Stop looking at the mirror. Stop being so interested in your own opinion about yourself and get your mind on Jesus Christ. Get your eyes on Jesus Christ. Get your imagination on Jesus Christ. Spend your whole being to Jesus Christ. The one who, he is your righteousness. He is your faithfulness. He is your life. He is your savior, amen? And, and, and he's the only source of life we have. Get your eyes on the one who's the only source of hope you have, the only source of love you've got, the only source of real profound joy that you've got. Get your eyes off of yourself and get it on Jesus Christ. The one who, who when, when you were, amen, uh, when, when you were lost, he loved you. When you were blind, he loved you. When you were captive, he loved you. When you were enemies of his, he loved you. Uh, when you would mock him, he still loved you. And, and, and because of that, he was willing to pour out everything to save us, to cleanse us, to redeem us, to restore us, to liberate us, to free us from our own bondage, to free us from the devil's bondage, to free us from the destiny that we had. Get your eyes off yourself and onto the beauty of Jesus Christ. And see, that's what we're transformed from one degree of glory to another, Paul says, as we gaze upon his beauty. It's not when we look at ourselves and wonder, okay, I'll try harder. That's, no, that, that, that's like trying to swim in quicksand. It'll just sink, sink you deeper. Get your eyes off yourself and onto the Lord and, and, and behold his beauty. And it's, it's not, his beauty in contrast to all that's ugly in us is what beautifies us. His beauty in contrast to all that's ugliness in us is what transforms us. Amen. And some folks need to generalize this even further. It's not just during communion where you might be tempted to do this. Some folks live in this I'm not worthy or am I worthy kind of question. Am I worthy? Uh, if the Puritans used to do this a lot. If you read Jonathan Edwards' uh, journals, for example, it's, it's, they, 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 were, they tortured themselves. Am I one of God's elect? How can I be sure? How can I be sure I'm one of God's elect? Maybe I, my motives might not have been altogether pure. Uh, you know, uh, I think maybe I, I, when I showed love towards that person, it was because I wanted to be noticed. For my, oh, maybe, am I really singing first the kingdom of God? Do I love God with my whole heart? Maybe it's only part of my heart. You know, am I meditating on my daily? Am I praying enough? Am I reading the Bible enough? Have I been witnessing enough? Have I been doing anything enough? Oh, I, am I really genuine? Am I authentic? You can go crazy asking those kind of questions. Because you know what? You can't answer them. That's the thing about How would you know? You, you really can't answer those. A lot of those are just, you can always doubt stuff. Is, is this genuine speaking in tongues or maybe I'm just making up? Uh, is, am I really seeing the Lord or, or maybe this is my, just my imagine? Am I really hearing from God or maybe that? You can call everything into question and all it does is paralyze you. And the enemy can get involved in that. He's called the accuser for a reason. If you're into this, this you know, always introspection, hey, listen, it's great to sometimes pray, Lord, search my heart. You know, reveal anything and clean me. That's a great thing. But that's way different than living there where you're always wrapped up in a question. And, 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 there's no joy in that. You'll never, you'll never reason your way to a conclusion that will give you any kind of joy or any kind of peace. It's, it's bondage. It's imprisonment. It, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of slavery. And some folks, then, they do that not only with, with, with God, but they apply it to other people. 
Uh, if, if you're not getting your life from the Lord, well, then you'll try to get it from other people. And if you're living in this I, am, am I worthy place, you're probably not getting your life from God. And so what these folks do is they, they always are wondering, am I worthy of, of this friendship? Am I worthy of these people? Do I really belong here? What do they think about me? I wonder if they're judging me because of my hair. I, 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 what am I supposed to say here? What's the right thing to say here? What am I supposed to do here? I got, you know, I, I, and everything is all choreographed. If you're around these people, there's no spontaneity. It, 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 it's all choreographed. They're trying to fit in. Okay, well, it's, yeah, they walk like this. You can tell them because they always will. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're stiff. There's a stiffness. There's no freedom there. If, if, if there's any part of you that resonates with that scenario, you are one who lives in this am I worthy place. I, I want to set you free. And, and the way to get free is this. Simple strategy. Stop trying to defend yourself. Right? You, you're in this, this judgment game, and, and, and you're asking the question, am I worthy? And you're hoping that you can say, yes, I am worthy. Yeah, I'm not as bad as that voice in my head says. I'm, I'm, I'm not as bad as some people think. I'm not blah, blah, blah. I've got reasons for whatever. Stop it! The best thing to do is for you to go the opposite direction. Give up. Lose that game. Say, you know what? I'm probably way worse than everything I po could possibly suspect about myself. And just acknowledge that, that I, I'm guilty as charged. And then remember one other thing, that everything you could possibly list as to what you're guilty of was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. It's done with. It's annihilated. It's over. It's irrelevant. Amen. You don't want to be trying to win in the judgment game because that's not a game that's winnable, and, and it's no credit to you if you win it. That, what you want is to opt out of the game altogether. That's why Jesus says, judge, and you're going to be judged. If you don't want to be judged, then don't judge. Opt out of that whole game. Uh, where you're concerned about what you think or what other people think and all that stuff, and, and just plead the blood of Jesus. You stand, if you stand before God, it's because you are in Christ Jesus by grace. And let that be your defense, okay? Just end all that discussion, that investigation, that interest, get rid of it, and, 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 and just throw yourself at the mercy of Jesus Christ. And you know what? The only, the only opinion that matters about you is the one that God has about you, and he gives you what his opinion is on Calvary. That's what God thinks about you, and that's all that matters. Yeah. Amen? That's all that matters. I have all that judgment game. L listen to what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 4. This is such a profound passage. He says, with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any of you in court. He didn't carry God's life from Christ. Because I don't even judge myself. Now that tells you that when Paul's talking about we should judge ourselves ahead of time, he's not talking about introspection stuff. Hey, I don't even judge myself. He's talking about community discernment. Are we taking the Lord's, are doing the Lord's Supper the right way? I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, for example. But I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. Savor this. Savor this. Um, Paul doesn't care what opinions are about him. Why? Because he knows what the Lord thinks about him, and that's all he cares about. And he doesn't even care what he thinks about himself. I don't follow this. He goes, I think, I think I'm innocent. I don't have anything that I know that, I, that I, I, is, is against me. But that doesn't mean I'm acquitted, because that's just my stupid brain. i got a fallen stupid brain. And sometimes it, it excuses me when actually I'm guilty. Sometimes it says I'm guilty when I'm actually innocent. i got to learn to ignore that thing. Uh, what matters is what the Lord thinks. And, and the Lord will judge me in, in time. He's, he's totally free about this. Yeah, I could, I could have stuff. I, he's, he's, but he's clearly not going to go on a search and rescue mission and trying to find out, is there anything possibly unclean in me? No, the Lord will bring it to light. This is a guy who's free. He does not care about the, he's opted out of the judgment game. He stands, if he stands at all, in the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is his identity. Jesus Christ is his righteousness. Jesus Christ is his faithfulness. Jesus Christ is his hope. So he doesn't need to be investing any value in opinions that people have about him or his own opinion. You guys, opinions are just a neurological little popping, a chemical reaction in our brain. And they don't change the world. They're just opinions about the world. And it's all part of the fallen matrix and all part of the accuser's judgment game. To opt out of that is freedom, total freedom, amen. To opt out of that is to finally learn what it is to be, to, to be motivated by love and gratitude rather than by fear and judgment. Folks, opt out of the game, opt out of the game. Make no judgments ahead of time. Paul say, don't have any judgments. It's like I always say around here, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're only allowed one opinion of people. 
unless they've invited you in to have discernment to help them live out the kingdom life. But if they haven't, you're allowed one opinion, and that's the one thing you know is that Jesus Christ died for them, therefore they must be worth dying for, therefore they have unsurpassable worth. And your one job is to reflect that unsurpassable worth by how you think about them, how you talk about them, how you talk to them, and how you treat them. End of story. You don't have to judge anything. And that is, so, folks, that is so freeing. It's hard being judge of the universe. It really is. We all do it. We have a gossip column in our brain. But, man, it's, it sucks love right out of you. It sucks love. It sucks joy right out of you. You uncork that. Every, every judgment is a cork in the geyser of God's infinite love. Uh, but when you uncork that, get rid of the judgments. Whenever you find yourself judging, just remember what Paul said. No, who cares about that? God will take care of all that in the end. Our job is just to love. And, man, the gusher starts to flow. And gushers feel good. Gusher of God's love, it feels good. It's like, ah, oh, let it flow, let it flow. It's just, yes, get out of the judgment game. Okay, so that, that's why we should be doing this tortured, introspective, am I worthy thing during communion. No, just confess that you're not. Stand in grace, and now turn your gaze upon Jesus Christ. But Paul does say then, because they are so desecrating the sign of the covenant, and throughout the Bible you find out that if you screw up the sign of the covenant, you're screwing up the covenant. God takes the sign of the covenant very seriously. And because they turned the meaning of the Lord's Supper into its opposite and were mocking it, Paul says that there's a judgment that's coming on them. And that's why he says, because of this, some have gotten ill and, and, and weak, and some have even died. So what do we do with that? Let me say a couple things. Uh, actually, I'm not sure what to do with that. Uh, but God forbid that I should ever let my ignorance get in the way of my pontificating, so I will find something to say. Some of the smartest things I ever say is when I have no idea what I'm talking about. It just <laughs> comes up. No, I'll, I'll say this. This is a weird passage, but first thing you got to know is that this is the only passage that says anything like this, that there's, you could actually die from taking communion in a way that's mocking communion. Um, there's, there's nothing else that corroborates with it. And the rule of thumb is uh, whenever you have a verse that stands alone, especially if it's not particularly clear, make the most sense out of it as you can, but don't ever base a teaching or a doctrine on it. If it's worth making a doctrine out of, there's going to be confirmations about it. It's not going to be a one-off kind of verse. Uh, one of the things that cults do a lot is they'll take a verse that is really fringe, kind of weird, and then they'll build a whole edifice on it. Uh, it it's, it's a bad idea. So it's, it's a, it's a one-off thing. Secondly, the, the fact that we don't have any record of people dying or getting sick as a result of taking communion in an unworthy way suggests that this is limited to Corinth. It's, this isn't a policy that God's in, in, enacting. If it was a policy, we'd see a pattern throughout history. Uh, it seems like this is just Paul discerning that because of maybe the, 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 where they are in church history and foundations are being laid or whatever, that, that God here is trying to teach a lesson about the importance of taking the Lord's Supper in a way that reflects the character of Jesus Christ rather than a way that reflects the, the selfishness and the hoarding of wealthy people in the face of poverty. And so, so we, we should make a principle out of this. And the third thing is, is uh, that uh, it's clear that the dying and the illness are, are judgment of God. But it, it doesn't mean that God is the one who is making people sick or killing people. Uh, yeah, Jesus Christ bore the judgment of God on, on the cross, and it was a violent judgment, but God didn't lift a finger towards him. The only thing that the Father did was turn him over. He withdrew protection and delivered Jesus over to wicked humans who were operating under fallen powers to do what they wanted to do. And that is all God ever does in bringing judgment. Throughout the Bible, you find this. God, with a grieving heart, lets people go. Um, and, and now the natural consequences of their decisions come upon them. And so Paul seems to be saying that this is what's happened at Corinth, that, that at least an element of divine protection has been removed, and now this judgment is coming upon them. Um, we don't know what the cause of the illness and stuff is. It could be demonic interference. It could, some have just said that, that since everything in a community is related to everything else, the, the selfish way that communion was being handled by the folks who had stuff and wouldn't share with the poor, that that may have affected like, the, the, the power of healing in, 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 at Corinth. Uh, Paul talks about the, the, those who have the gift of healing. But it could be the case that these people got sick like you normally do, and normally they would have got healed, but because the healing gift's being suppressed, because of the abuse of communion, well, that's why they, they died. We don't know. We don't know. But the important point is you don't have to think that God was the one who was making these people sick or, or killing them. Uh, it's just that their decisions have put them in a more vulnerable position than they otherwise would have been. So we're going to turn and take communion now. 
Uh, and during this time, I want to encourage us not to be, confess that you are unworthy. Don't, don't make it into a contest. Are you worthy enough? No. It, it, God may reveal some things to you that relationships that need to be taken care of or things like that. Pay attention to that. But our focus is, is not on ourself. Our focus is on Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And, and, and so I want us to, with every ounce of our being, as we enter this time of communion, be thinking about him, be meditating on him, be singing to him, be singing about him. And, um, and then when you, you feel it's the right time, as we're going into this time of worship, um, I just, just go up and take the communion elements. All, all the communion elements are gluten-free, and so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, just stand up and, and go and take the communion. If you're with some people that you came to church with and you want to take it together, we encourage that as well. So can I ask the worship team to come up here as we go into this time of worship? We here at Wilderness Church don't do background checks on people before we let you take communion because Jesus didn't do background checks at the Last Supper. So I don't care if you're Judas, you're welcome to take it, all right? Um, and and uh, here's the thing that, that encourage us to, to uh, yeah, just really retain that focus throughout this whole thing. So in, in the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup that they were going to eat, uh, the cup that they were going to drink. Well, first he took the bread that they were going to eat. You know, it's, it's a hard order to remember. You know, I, I, after 30 years, I thought I would have had downright. But the bread always comes first. And he broke it in front of them and said, this, this bread is my body, which is to be broken for you. So whenever you come together and eat bread, I want you to do it in memory of me. Uh, remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. And they took the cup in the same way. He said... This cup is the cup of the new and the everlasting covenant, for this cup represents my blood, which is going to be shed for you. And so when you come together and are having this meal, do it in memory of me. Remember what it costs to enter into this covenant. And so we focus on all the Lord has done. Let it get deep into our heart. And then let it change us. Because you can't possibly be really absorbed in the beauty and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ and not have gratitude well up in your heart. And it's that gratitude, as I, as I shared last week, it's that gratitude that begins to percolate over in terms of generosity. And now we're developing the same mind that Jesus Christ had, who, though he was equal with God, didn't cling to his equality with God, but rather emptied himself and made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a servant and was obedient even unto death. In response to what Jesus has done for us, we want to be a people who we, our, our job in the, in the new covenant is to commit to, be, to doing likewise. And as the Lord changes our heart, we commit to submitting all that we have before him and obeying him in terms of how he says we should use it. Let that same mind be in you that was also in Jesus Christ. Father, invade us with your powerful presence, your radical love, your outstanding grace, your beautiful holiness. Invade this place. And sear the kingdom into our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Anyone feeling a little sick right about now? <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, praise God. I, 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 I honestly love uh, sharing experiences like this with you guys. It's, I consider it is the deepest honor. And uh, just to be recipients of this, we're so blessed, are we not? I, 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 so blessed. So, so blessed. Amen. I want to ask the prayer teams to come forward, and if you're here this morning and have any need that could use prayer, uh, please come up here by the stairs, and these folks would love to minister to you. And if you're here this morning and you're not a fully devoted follower of Jesus, uh, I encourage you to think about that, pray about that, consider it, and if you want to talk to